welcome to the Your Life Unfiltered podcast with your host, Ketu Kothari and Deepam Jain. In this podcast, we dig deep into the life experiences of our guests, the connected dots between their upbringing and what they're doing today. Today, we have special guest, Tarab Kowaja. Tarab, if you want to quickly introduce yourself. Sure, absolutely. So I'm Tarab. I'm from New Jersey. I am a supply chain professional. I've been working in supply chain for about a decade now. And originally, I'm an engineer and uh, just have always had a passion for problem solving and decided supply chain is the field to do it in. And I'm from New Jersey. I uh, have been a Jersey guy through and through. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Sir, I'm great to have you. If, if you don't mind, if you could go back a few years, you know, your early childhood, early upbringing, um, you know, to talk about some of the motivations and inspirations that you've had early on that basically kind of led you to do what you're doing today. That would be great. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I, I can start with a little bit of my uh, background. Mm-hmm. So I actually came to the U.S. back in 2008. Uh, so originally I was born and raised in Pakistan, in, uh, in Islamabad, Pakistan. Um, I'm a, I'm a Pakistani guy from Hort. I love cricket, still, still watch it. I, I am a, a mama's boy. I love home cooked meals. I'm a, I'm a daisy guy. And I came to the U S in 2008 when I was still in high school. So I moved to Elmwood Park, New Jersey, um, went to high school here. And then when it came time for me to uh, go to college, Rutgers university in New Jersey is like 13th grade for anybody in North Jersey. So <laughs> decided to go to Rutgers University. I initially went into uh, uh, deciding my career based on wanting to go into the medical field. So I initially wanted to do pre-med, but decided that I wanted to have a major where I would have options that if I would choose not to go into the medical field. So I selected chemical engineering as my major. Um, for me, I... I was very fortunate that I had a couple of AP classes coming into college. So I was able to mm-hmm. complete my chemical engineering degree uh, within three years. And at that point I had a, you can say a very good job for a college student in my hometown. So I used to go to my work over the weekends while going to college during the week. And for me at that time, I, I was in uh, work hard mode trying to just get good grades so I can keep my scholarships, trying to get through college with a good degree and trying to at the same time save some money so that when I would get out of college, I at least had a, had a good base. And in terms of my career, I, I was very fortunate. I had an internship with Unilever down in their ice cream factory in Tennessee. Um, and the funny story about that is I had never been outside of New Jersey, New York prior to going to Tennessee. So Tennessee was my first hmm. experience outside of the East Coast. And I'm proud to say I'm one of the first people to actually have tasted uh, one of the new variations of the Klondike Reese's uh, ice cream bar. So down in Tennessee, they used to make ice cream brands like Fudsco, Popsco, Fatari. As I said, I, up until that point, was still considering going into the medical field after graduating from college. But really going through that internship uh, in supply chain uh, motivated me to actually go into supply chain after college. Mm-hmm. And for me, I was, uh, I was lucky that I, I had the opportunity to go to their management training program. So I started right after, right after college with Unilever in a full-time role, uh, initially working up in Connecticut in their logistics headquarters, uh, worked in logistics for a while, and then moved back into manufacturing. Uh, I relocated again to Indiana, where they had a soap bar manufacturing facility, um, and mm-hmm. worked there in manufacturing. And then at that point, I had been away from New Jersey for a couple of years. I wanted to come back because my family, my friends, everything was over here. And I, I really wanted to, um, in a way, come back home. And at that mm-hmm. point, uh, there was a team that half of the team sat in the Unilever headquarters in New Jersey and half the team sat in Switzerland. And uh, in strategic planning, I had the opportunity to uh, go into that team. Initially, the head of the department said, I promise you, I'll bring you back to New Jersey. But first, I want you to relocate to Switzerland and we'll bring you back after we get a couple of projects done there. And I had the opportunity to live in Switzerland, live in Europe, enjoy that in my early years of my uh, my adulthood as well, which was an mm-hmm. absolutely incredible experience. And then from there, I came back to New Jersey and I was content where I was, but 
I wanted to go into operational planning. Could reach out on LinkedIn, which at that point I wasn't very active on, to be very honest. And I didn't even realize how you can use LinkedIn as a as a tool to build your network. I always thought that you build your network in the industry through conferences or through seminars. But LinkedIn really took off for me personally in those in those years. And uh, long story short, an opportunity came my way to join L'Oreal, mm -hmm. uh, where I actually met. Uh, the the co-host of this podcast as well, uh, Katul, and we became good friends. It essentially was working in uh, operational planning uh, for a while, and since then I've had some success there. Um, apart from that, I when I came back to New Jersey, I actually bought a home in the same bought a house in the same town that I grew up in New Jersey, and my friends still make fun of me saying you relocated from New Jersey to Tennessee to Connecticut to Indiana to New York, and when you came back to New Jersey, you had to come back to the same town you left but it's homely for me right so uh, mm -hmm. as i said I, there's a there's a part of new jersey in me which i carry on wherever i am in the world um, and then in terms of my passions i i love playing tennis i played tennis when i was uh high school i um i love watching cricket um uh, we got the world cup coming up so looking i know <laughs> i'm sure a lot a lot of pakistanis and indians in new jersey are too yeah uh, and that's just a little bit about myself. That's a little bit more about my uh, my history and my background. Awesome. Nice, fantastic. Um, so here's a couple questions to build upon your experience of transitioning countries, right? So you grew up in Pakistan and then you came to the U.S., right? Was there any like struggles you faced from a cultural assimilation perspective shifting over, or was it a lot more natural for you to integrate into the way things are here? It's, it's a very interesting question. Um, for me, I think the hardest part wasn't actually the, the society at large. It was more around my high school. So I, I, I'd been coming to the U.S. like every two or three years for vacations. So it, the, there wasn't a language barrier and there wasn't a lack of understanding of how um, the norm of the day-to-day -day works here. But I, I would definitely say school, especially middle school and high school in, in the U.S. is significantly different than Pakistan. And the the way that even the classes work, meaning in Pakistan, we used to have the same class and teachers would come to our class. Well, in the U.S., you have you go to classes, you have semesters, you have the way that you're graded is even different, standardized testing, etc. And then on top of that, having a, the, the social piece of high school was different. And honestly, I was I was when I came to the U.S., I, I definitely missed my time in, in Pakistan because the school that I was in, I actually grew up in that school. So. There was a out of a hundred and eighty people in my grade when I came here from Pakistan, about I would say seventy eight eighty kids were people who I grew up with since first grade. So for wow. me, adjusting mm -hmm. to it was more about adjusting to not being in Pakistan rather than adjusting to the U.S. I I, I feel like now that I look back at it, I had, a, I had a great time in high school, especially my last two years. I felt like my when I came here at the end of ninth grade my end of ninth grade and 10th grade, I, I didn't enjoy as much because I felt like I was still trying to accumulate, which I, I could have done faster if I got over uh, my time in Pakistan quicker. Got it. Okay. Wow. That's interesting. And so why supply chain, right? Because you said you had a degree in chemical engineering. So do you try your hand at the engineering route first and then move to supply chain? Or did you just knew like right from the get go, you wanted to get into the supply chain? domain so interestingly enough I, I actually when i went into chemical engineering it was with the intent that i was going to use that degree to get into medical school so literally i, I my internship with unilever was in the summer of 2013 up until the spring of 2013 my plan was to go into medical school after graduating i even had a file open with umdnj which is affiliated um, a medical school affiliated with uh, rutgers university I was fully planning on applying in the fall to that medical school. And I, honestly, the reason why I went to the uh, internship with Unilever is because I didn't find an internship in the medical field that summer. So for me, it was just something to get on my resume, at least have some experience uh, over the summer. And, um, and I, I was very fortunate that we had a career fair at Rutgers where I went there and I, I was able to get this opportunity. And honestly, I, up until that summer, I had no intentions of going into supply chain. For me, it was either going to medical school or trying to pick up a process engineering job after, after college. It wasn't until I went to 
the factory, the, the ice cream factory in the middle of nowhere in Tennessee, <laughs> where I, I, I was so, um, I, I was inspired by the fact of how big supply chain was and how uh, little I knew about it. How, I, I never thought of supply chain as, as a career up until that point where I, I, I was like, this is just one part of, one of four parts of supply chain. I, I think I can spend 30 years just in this particular function. Uh, whether it be moving vertically or whether it be trying to become a subject matter ac- expert. So for me, that, that three, four months, I would say, really were pivotal in my, in my professional life and obviously in my personal life as well to make the call that I actually wanted to go into supply chain after, after college. And honestly, that fall stars aligned. Um, I got the opportunity I, and decided to pursue that. Yeah. And that sounds like a dream uh, internship as well. Like you are working in an ice cream factory, <laughs> tasting ice creams. I think that's probably a dream for uh, for many of us. So how was, uh, like, when you were there, uh, I'm just curious about how the internship experience works, right? So do you, uh, do you get assigned projects? Are you shadowing other people on the existing projects? Obviously, you're, you're touring the factories and trying to figure out how the manufacturing works. So w- what was... Can you just spill a little bit more beans there, obviously without going too much specific? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, and mm-hmm. a great thing about companies like Unilever or Procter & Gamble, L'Oreal, Johnson Johnson, the, the thing is they they want to make sure that you're, you're getting the most out of an internship. So I, when I was there, I had a was specifically assigned to me. So mm-hmm. the goal for the internship is, A, obviously for you to learn as much as possible about the function you're in, along with the delivering on project that you've been assigned so I when I was there I had a obviously I had a had a supervisor and then I had a mentor that I can utilize for anything that I needed whether it be uh, in the factory or outside of uh, outside of the factory so I can get comfortable with my surroundings um, there was a there was a project that I actively worked on which allowed me to interact with different people in manufacturing from safety professionals in, in, in the factory to the operators in the factory to the engineers in the factory, even to, to the finance team in, in the factory. So I, I was very lucky that through that particular project that I was um, uh, uh, managing, I was mm-hmm. able to interact with different facets of the factory to see how it actually works. I, I think everybody has uh, uh, preconceived notions of how a factory works. You have operators, they're just trying to uh, put stuff into a packaging uh, item and trying to ship it out of the factory. But the the intricacies and the the details of how a factory works that internship was able to uh, to provide me with that and then i also was able to shadow different people at my time uh, in tennessee and that allowed me that was really when i started to understand what supply chain was because up until mm-hmm. that point my understanding of supply chain was i would say limited to um, manufacturing and the fact that i got to see how that one function of supply chain works with all of the different functions from logistics to planning mm-hmm. to purchasing to procurement to finance to hr to even it uh, that is mm-hmm. i think as an intern I, I was very very fortunate that i had that experience and also i i was around great people and i, I think my experience there would have not been the same if i wasn't around the, the people that I was mm-hmm. that's right. awesome fantastic yeah thank you for sharing that um, I did want to switch gears a little bit and talk a little bit about your Amazon business, Balone Five. If you want to tell us, tell everyone here about how you came, you know, how that project came <laughs> to being, how's it's going, you know, what's next for that business, et cetera. Absolutely, absolutely. No, it's 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 a you can say a passion project of mine, which has become a, a hobby that doesn't cost me money but makes me a little bit more a little bit more of money, which is always good to have. Um, so when I was in, as I mentioned, when I was at Unilever, I had the chance to move to Switzerland. And at that point, I had worked within supply chain, within the logistics function, manufacturing, and a bit in planning. But at that point, I was still pretty young in my career, and I, I wanted to see, I, I really wanted to connect the dots of supply chain and operations to see whether or not I could lay the foundation of operations myself. And I was just, again, I, I was in Switzerland. I didn't knew anybody, so one weekend I was just, searching and exploring how would I start a business if I wanted to start a business from a physical product. And at that point, I learned about Amazon and how Amazon FBA sellers and individual sellers basically have launched their products on Amazon with as little as less than $3,000, $4,000. And that blew my mind because I always thought that if you wanted to start a business, you need to have thousands and thousands of dollars that you need to be ready to invest. 
and I, I was pretty surprised that you could start a brand and start selling on Amazon uh, with having the logistics uh, operations be managed by Amazon as well as have operations that you can set up um, by yourself for that level of an amount. And I, I, that curiosity really became a passion project of mine. And I started searching on what were the major areas on Amazon at that time that weren't as, um, I would say, dominated by big companies and a place uh, on Amazon Marketplace, which where there was opportunity for new new businesses was, believe it or not, in the space of travel items and specifically travel pillows. So I, at that point, decided, okay, I'm going to design a travel pillow and see if I can sell it on Amazon. I'm going to put two, $3,000 into it and see if I can launch this stuff I launched this particular product on Amazon. If so, great. If not, I'll just chalk it off to a learning experience in, in my supply chain career as a as something I invested in a course, right? And basically the first half of 2017 is where I dedicated to um, actually uh, launching this particular product. Uh, so I found manufacturers in China that could design, that could produce the product that I had designed. I basically contracted a logistics provider that can get my uh, products from China to the Amazon FBA DC um, in, in the US and then Amazon for a fee basically is able to uh, ship your products and also um, is able to store your products. I thought that this was gonna be uh, really easy. I was really impressed with myself that I, I had set up this operation and then in August, 2017, I launched this and didn't sell a single unit for a good week. And I was like, wait, I'm on Amazon. Why, why isn't my product selling? And then the, the light bulb went off that I'm not doing any advertising or marketing. All I have done is on Facebook towards my friends. I need to be reaching a bigger audience. And at that point, I, I realized that be, from, from an entrepreneurial standpoint, I was coming from a supply chain operations background and I thought operations was the most important aspect of a business and then realized that there's a sales and marketing aspect, which I had to learn. So over the course of the next couple of weeks, I started learning about advertising campaigns on Facebook, Google, Amazon. How do you set up a marketing campaign? How do you, how much you need to invest in it? How much you can uh, optimize to be able to get the most bang for your buck? And slowly but surely, I in a month or so, I started selling about 10 units a week. And then the biggest, my a mistake that I made, which became sort of a, uh, I found a, a really defining moment in this particular project was I accidentally put a couple of coupons on, which if people used correctly, could basically get my product for free. So in a day I sold about 30 units and I, I thought, how could this be? And when I looked into it, I realized that I just gave away those 30 products for free and I had to live with that because that was, I was selling on Amazon, they used the coupons and I was really bummed out because I was out like 150 bucks, right? But I didn't realize that by doing so, and there were a lot of people that tried out my products, gave me good reviews. So in the algorithm of Amazon, they said that, okay, this guy was able to sell 30 products, which a lot of people liked, put reviews on. And that actually started having my, my listing come higher and higher on a particular um, segment of the, of the <coughs> And then from there, really, I, I focused more on what I had learned in terms of marketing and how, could, how I can use that type of a learning. And then the holiday season towards the end of the year in 2017, I, I, I didn't, I sold about eight times what I was selling in a month and I sold out of my inventory and ran out. And since then I have basically been on more of a cruise control where I know exactly what type of campaigns I have to run in the year. Uh, when in the year I have to, um, I have to reorder for my manufacturer who already has my specs, who already has everything that he, they need to be able to produce at the right time, produce a quantity. I have a logistics provider and it's almost on cruise control where I'm spending maybe five hours a month. Um, I'm in no shape or form making bank uh, from this particular business. I'm making some change on the side, which I'm, which helps me pay off my mortgage a little bit sooner. Um, but it's, it's a passion project that, that became something that I tweak with here and there just as a, as a hobby, but it, it, it's generating me a little bit of money on the side. It helped me learn a lot about, being uh, a business owner, being an entrepreneur, being able to understand how marketing and sales works. And honestly, the major reason why I started was being able to connect the dots in supply chain and operations, which I've 
helped me absolutely greatly. And I think over the last four or five years have, has helped me in my professional career outside of follow on five, um, in, in my own professional career as a supply chain, uh, as a, as a supply chain individual. Amazing. Amazing. Uh, so Turab, first of all, thanks so much for sharing that entire process. Um, uh, so you, you basically walked us through the entire, you know, your, from where you started and how it kind of progressed. I have a few questions, especially when you were in the setup phase. Um, you know, as you're designing the product, as you're trying to kind of find the manufacturer in the, in the, in the China or wherever. So how are you able to kind of test the product? So let's say, what is, your, the, what is the process that you use to design the product and test it? Because I, I can imagine like it was not, uh, a one shot process, right? You just designed it and it was done and you had to go back and forth and it's a physical product. So you need to see how it's looking like and so on. So what does that process uh, look like? And then I have a follow-up question, which, you know, I can, I can ask afterwards. No, absolutely. And, and you're absolutely mm -hmm. right. It's never a one and done thing. It, I want to say I, I went through 17 or 18 tries before I actually landed on the product that I'm selling on Amazon today. So wow, Look at basically that. <laughs> you initially start with, okay, what is the product that you want to sell? Now, okay, if it's a neck pillow, how is mine different than the thousands of others on, on, on right. the place, right? So for me at that time, I realized there weren't a lot of uh, neck pillows that had a hoodie as well. So initially I, I designed the base of the neck pillow, realized it wasn't really that different or unique from what people was were putting out already. The second piece was what's the material I'm gonna use in the neck, material, in the neck pillow so that it's more comfortable than what's on the market. The third iteration was, how do I make the hoodie in a way that it is, it's comfortable for all neck sizes. At the same time, it's able to provide the comfort from lighting or from other people, especially on an airplane when you don't want to talk to someone. Uh, then so th those were basically the iterations I went through in terms of the design piece. Mm -hmm. Then from there, I send my specs to three or four different manufacturers. Those three or four different manufacturers send me samples of what, they could do with the specs that I had sent them. And, I then, see. and then from there, I, I basically have to dwindle down those four or five manufacturers to one manufacturer. And then from there, I have to finalize the design. So for Got me, it. It, 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 it in no shape or form was a one-time one thing. There mm -hmm. were different stages of the design and then there were different stages of what we would call the, the trial, the line trial process. And then from there, we had, I had a product that I can say, okay, now I have the actual product that I get, I'm going to sell. Then on top of that, you have to decide what's the packaging you're going to put it on. Are you going to put it on a, uh, a box type packaging or are you going to put it on more of a, a, poly, uh, a, a plastic bag type uh, packaging or something different in which I also had to take into account the requirements that Amazon had for shipping, right. et cetera. So it. I, it was a process that I... I started, if I were to say how many months it took me, it took me a good, a very good seven to eight months just to come up with that final product from the time of me starting that process of design to me actually getting to a product where I said, okay, this is what I'm going to sell on Amazon. That's amazing. And this is all, is this all happening after you've set up your entity already or like establish your entity, legal entity, I mean, as a company, uh, either in the US or, or wherever you're trying to, uh, can establish or is it like is it this still happening before you even have a company you're still trying to kind of tinker with your idea you know just working uh, outside of your office hours to kind of do the design just going back and forth and so on yep exactly it, it was something i was doing outside of my office hours honestly it wasn't until i got to the last stages of when I saw the light at the end of the tunnel where I said, okay, this, this is actually a business that I'm launching. Initially it was just a product that I wanted to put on Amazon. And that was the extent of it. Right. After I got towards the end of the design process. And at that point I was still educating myself in how I would set this up, how I would sell it, how I would do the taxes, how I would collect the revenue, how I would um, define my PNL, how, what would be my listing price. What would be the, I basically had to put together a full profit and loss statement for this. Of course. That, all of that happened, I would say, in the last quarter of that process of me designing that product to say, okay, now I'm in, in a phase where I'm going to go into manufacturing. And before I go there, I need to make sure that I have all my ducks in a row. Um, and again, I, I didn't anticipate to be making 
a six figures off of this anytime for that. But at least it gave me um, the ability to be able to utilize this business as a uh, as an entity under underneath me as the rock Quaja and something that I can use on my taxes as well. Awesome. Okay, that's awesome. That's fantastic. And here's a question about the growth of the brand, right? So I know over the years you probably have been able to fine tune the approaches and all that. But what's next for Falone Five? Are you looking at potentially looking at expanding the number of product offerings down the road or you just want to keep it as is and just continue to have that recurring revenue coming from it or what's what's your goal for for loan five as we look at the next couple of years it's, it's a very very interesting question because up until the pandemic my goal wasn't actually to increase my product listing but get into non-e-commerce channels so oh. either distributors or walmart or target and then <laughs> Believe it or not, I, I realized that there's there's so much there's so many distributors out there that I actually if you search for on five, you can find it on Target, Walmart, in e-commerce channels that they have because you have distributors who basically buy it from other countries and then send it back to the US with an up charge where I, I realized that for me, my growth wasn't going to come from uh, exp- from this one product expanding its, its, its the channels that I was selling it at. And honestly, it was definitely a lot more of a, a headache and would hit my p and more than what I'm making right now in terms of my profit margins. So for me, I I recently have started looking into how I would want to grow uh, the, the product offering that I would have on the phone on five and have it be more than just... Um, wearable items and be more of accessories i would say on the travel side oh okay being hmm. transparent over the over the course of the pandemic that right before the pandemic is when i had started the, that process and honestly during pandemic it was a it was a bit of a challenge time because as you can imagine travel was the last place where any growth was happening <laughs> yeah that's true right? <laughs> that's true <laughs> So, funny enough, my sales got obviously. I, I had a hit in twenty twenty to my sales. I was growing double digit every year uh, since twenty seventeen up until twenty twenty to a point where, if it had kept on growing and the pandemic didn't happen in twenty twenty three or twenty twenty four, I would have been in a place where, um, I, I would have been making decent money. I would say out of it, where I I would be considering actually focusing my time more towards this business. But with with that hit, I I did take a step back with the, with the business to see what I would want to do in the future. I'm I'm starting that process again over the course of the last couple of months. Again, I'm I'm in a different place in my professional career, where I, I'm not able to spend as much time as I was when I was in Switzerland. Uh, but it's something that I'm slowly working on. As I said, it's still more of a passion project for me than it is a business. But it's, it's now established almost in itself as a business and where I started in 2017. Okay. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. Well thought out the answer there. And I do realize that this is not the, the only project you worked on, right? You've worked on a couple other things. I vaguely remember a project you worked on related to e-commerce of like luxury menswear. Um, is that right? I, I think it was luxury menswear, right? It was like accessories, like ties and label pins and stuff like that. Do you want to talk a little bit about about that? It that was so the best way to describe that one is while this project I started and became a business because I had a passion of understanding operations, I had honestly started that to get better at marketing uh, because that oh. that was uh, a business that I started to see if I can basically market products that I really really liked and that, at a certain level had some level of design to them, but to be very transparent, they weren't. They had that uh, they were luxury products uh, which I had uh, designed and worked with my manufacturers on. But they, at the end of the day, a tie is a tie, right? It's more about what is the uh, the essence of the brand that you are selling that tie with. Why is that tie different than other competitors on the market? And that's where your marketing skills, your sales skills, that's where your understanding of the market that you're in and how to adapt to it comes into play. And for me, I had started that project uh, with that intention. Um, again, it, w- it was starting to pick up uh, uh, its feet right when the pandemic came and uh, the pandemic basically killed that project wow. after a year, um, a year and a half. But for me, I, I, I did learn a lot from, um, from that particular project slash business, which I've sort of brought back into 
um, Funnel and Five, which helped me basically keep this brand and this business alive while it was going through the, the pandemic, uh, uh, the pandemic months. Awesome. All right, so Nitharab, thanks so much for sharing your journey. Obviously, you there was a I'm sure there's a lot of highs and lows, and you know as you're going through this, you're you know sometimes trying to <laughs> kind of figure out what's going on, and the other days are like really really good and so on. Um, so kind of now looking back, uh, Thorab, uh, just wanted to get your perspective in in this journey. How much of the success that you've had, both in your the 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 passion project as well as in your career? How much of that success do you attribute to luck, and how much to uh, your own hard work, or is there is there a combination between the two? Just wanted to get your perspective on that. There's always a combination of the two. Um, I, mm-hmm. I obviously I, the way that I was the way that I was brought up by my parents. It's it's always you need to put in the effort. You have to put in the time. But there is an aspect of luck. There is an aspect of being at the right time at the right place. Uh, for me, I. I mean, the best example I can give you is, as I mentioned earlier, the three months that I spent in Tennessee were a pivotal part of my life. Uh, because if the, those three months did not happen, I would have not been in Spy Chain. I would have not been creating businesses on the side for me. I would have not done any of the things I've done. And even that three months came only because I was sitting one day in my computer lab and I had a friend come by, print resumes and said, what are you doing? They said, there's a career fair, don't you know? try to go to the career fair tomorrow. If I would have not been there, I would have never had this opportunity. So it, it, there is an mm-hmm. aspect of the right place at the right time. Obviously, yeah. when you have the opportunities, when, um, whether you call it luck, whether you uh, whether you call it something else, when you have those opportunities come your way, you have to make sure that you're taking advantage of them. You, you have to make sure that you're putting the best foot forward. Um, so it's, it's definitely a combination of the two. Um, mm-hmm. And it's also the, the one... The one thing I've done in my career is always look towards how can I bring value to whatever I'm doing, uh, apart from what the regular day to day would be, whether it be my with my employer, whether it would be with my with my side projects or businesses. It's always what can I do that would bring additional value to what the the usual uh, thing mm-hmm. would be with the, with these types of uh, activities and. As I said, for any success, it's a combination of your hard work. It's a combination of your support system around you, which is my family, which to be very, the last eight years wouldn't be possible if I didn't have the support of my parents, my siblings. Um, and then obviously um, uh, being at the right place at the right time. Great awesome. answer. Appreciate that. So Tarab, I actually had a question. Um, I know you've had a great career path professionally, um, especially within L'Oreal today, um, where you currently work. Do you have any advice for our listeners here in terms of how do you organize yourself in terms of your controlling your perception, controlling the you know where you focus your efforts in order to set that framework to get promoted? Absolutely, I I, I can I I I wouldn't say that there's there's one specific framework that works for everybody. I, I can share my experience and what I think has worked well for my career. Sure. So, so I think the foundation of it really was set with when I was in the management training program with Unilever, where I had a mentor who still is a good friend of mine till this day. And he's someone who has years of experience and he as well has uh, seen a lot of success in his own professional career. I think that the three aspects of, I think what helps you get to the next level is obviously for as simple as it sounds being good at the job that you currently have. Number two, what is that additional value that you're bringing to the table? And number three, networking. Um, There's a saying that it is about uh, who you know. I I would say that's not the case. I think it's about who knows you. At the end of the day, there there are people who who at sometimes like going back to the conversation about being at the right place at the right time, if people know in your organization what you want to do, when that time comes, they would readily want to talk to someone who actually wants those opportunities than have to go look out for people who and search for people from the get go. I think in my in my career, the first aspect of it is a given. If if you're not doing a good job in, in the role that you're in, if you are not a good fit, you need to move to a place where you feel that you are and where you feel would do well. And that's where 
for again as simple as it sounds you need to put in the time the effort to educate yourself to get better and then be able to be a dependable uh, asset in your team that everybody can look towards and that's something that for as simple as it sounds it's not as simple um, the second aspect is and this is something that was ingrained in me during my management training days which is what is that additional project? What is that additional ways of working improvement? What is that additional process improvement? What is that additional activity that you're doing that's bringing value to the team that you're on that you can say that this is the uh, above and beyond that you're going because this is something you're passionate about. And again, it's, it's not something that you check off a box. It's truly something that you work on that you feel passionately about. And for me, mm -hmm. in my time at Unilever, as well as my time at L'Oreal, there have been different things that, again, I've been very fortunate that I've had the liberty to go after apart from my day to day, which have sort of translated into the, that additional value that I bring to the teams um, in different roles that I've been. And the third aspect of it, which I'm, I'm a, um, I would say an introvert, but whenever I test, I test as an extrovert because I feel like I've been <laughs> almost trained uh, in, in how to sort, how to network well uh, within the teams I'm in. And again, networking is, it's not about just meeting someone. It's about being able to understand the journey, similar to the conversation that we're having today, really, of understanding the journey that different people have taken and what has worked for them, what hasn't worked for them, and basically sharing your journey with them as well. I have not come across a single person, whether it be the VP or president of an operations or whether it be an analyst that I'm talking to. Everybody loves to talk about uh, their background as well as be able to learn about yours and what drives you, what motivates you. And this is probably one of the reasons why a podcast like this is very intriguing and interesting. Mm -hmm. It's because of that human aspect, I would say, to a, to a professional setting that sometimes might be not as um, social. Um, and then the second part is obviously speaking to what is it that, that next thing that, you look, that you're looking to go into and why you're passionate about it. And that's the, the aspect, the overall aspect of networking that I think um, as someone who has been in, in, in the career for about a decade now that I can give to somebody who's just joining is uh, find those people that you would want to network with, find those people that uh, are in the functions that you want to work, and then just simply talk to them. It's nothing formal. It's nothing that you have to organize. Just let them know that you want to learn about their background, share what you have done, what you want to do, and what's the best way to get there. Awesome. No, thanks so much for sharing that. So that's a beautiful piece of advice for everybody who is looking to grow in, the, in their professional careers as well as you know, just about their passions that related to um, switching gears a little bit. So we, we talked a lot about the, the professional lives, you know, as well as the, the business that you're running on the side. What do you like to do outside of those two things when you're not doing, let's say if you're not working at L'Oreal or you're not uh, worrying about full on, what, what else are you, uh, you know, doing in your day-to-day uh, -day life <laughs> those two take up a lot of my time during the weekday but uh during the weekends uh, it's a combination of obviously spending time with my family and my friends um mm -hmm. i'm i have a group of my friends from rugby's which i we love going out to football games we love um going to sport events uh, as I said, I, I have an interest in watching cricket, so it's something that I do with a lot of my friends, uh, a lot of my Daisy friends in New Jersey. <laughs> and then also, I, I I loved loved playing tennis when I was in high school. I I actually it, it was a field that I was looking into. I, I actually got a I'm, I'm going to do a humble brag here. I got a a scholarship to uh, play tennis in a, in a, in, a, in a university you have never heard of given. But uh, I, I was slightly good <laughs> in tennis when I was in high school. It, it, it was something that I picked up in high school and has kept with me till this day. So I, I have a couple of friends from high school that I sometimes play here and there. So really between going out to sporting events, playing tennis, watching cricket, and spending time with my family and friends. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. So since you, since you mentioned cricket, uh, Thurab, I just want to ask you, uh, sorry to put you on spot, but, do you, but what do you think are the chances of uh, Pakistan winning this upcoming T20 World <laughs> Cup? <laughs> uh, it's, it's a very good question. I, listen, I'll open this way. I like, I like our chances from a bowling standpoint. Batting, we, we got to get there. I, I think uh, we have a really good top order, and I don't know how many listeners are going to know the names that I'm going to say, but Bob Rosen and Rizwan, we have a pretty good uh, 
uh, top of the order. We have a pretty good bottom of the order as well as with some good finishers. I think yeah. our batting from the middle order standpoint isn't as strong as it used to be in, in the days gone of Intamal Mohawk, Muhammad Yusuf, Yunus Khan. So I, I think uh, I, I like our chances if we're playing on pitches that help the bowlers. If we're playing on pitches that help the batsmen, I'm not I'm not as confident <laughs> out. <laughs> <laughs> and I I know exactly which players that you're talking about because uh, as you know, I, some you, listeners might know, but India and Pakistan have a long-standing rivalry, yep. <laughs> especially when it comes to cricket and. All like I even to this day like I don't really watch cricket too much anymore. I used to follow every game before, but still, if there's an India and Pakistan match, I would definitely watch it, <laughs> no matter where I am in the world. Yeah, they're the most entertaining. The the funny thing is, and there's a joke yeah. in the world of cricket that the biggest rivalry is the Ashes rivalry, which is between England and Australia. Honestly, but, the, yeah. the rivalry between Pakistan and India, you got 1.5 billion people watching that. <laughs> yeah, that's, people. that's yeah, true. Yeah. <laughs> Just population alone, right? It's population alone. It's, uh, yeah. No, but all the best to the Pakistan team. I'm, I'm sure. Oh, we're in the same group, right? So we'll definitely play one match together. That, so I'm looking forward to that that one really soon. No, I'm, I'm, I'm honestly like, the, I think oh, you probably know this. There are a lot of fans of... Um, Kohli in Pakistan. I'm one of them as well. Who Kohli, for the people who don't know, is a, is a great batsman in, in the sport of cricket for India. And uh, I, I think he uh, he especially in, in in the coming years he he's focusing, I think, more on the ODI side and T20 side, if I'm not mistaken. So it's it's mm-hmm. great to watch these bat these players play in India and cricket in Pakistan. And for someone who has grown up uh, in that part of the world, the way that you would feel passionately about football with Tom Brady or with LeBron <laughs> James, that's how we we think and talk about people like uh, Coley and with mm-hmm. Bob Rosam. So it, it, it's just something that it, in my life, which has been a constant revolving, um, uh, the world has been spinning uh, at times in my life. I think that one constant that I've had since my time in Pakistan has been cricket. Um, and for me, I, as I said, it's, it's a love for the game that people from that part of the world have. Yeah, that's amazing. Okay, uh, Tarab, thanks so much for that. I think we are ready to move on to the next segment of our discussion. Which we call it Rapid Fire. So as the name suggests, you know, first thing that comes to mind to our questions. Let me know when you're ready and we'll just get right to it. Sure. All right. Tea or coffee? Neither. I, I don't drink either. <laughs> yeah, oh, team, no know, really? team no caffeine. Team no caffeine. Don't get me wrong. I'm a Coke Zero guy. I like drinking Coke Zero, but... I'm, I'm, I, I don't drink either. I, I'm, I'm a cold water guy. Oh, I, I, I wanted to guess tea because tea is super huge in Southeast Asia. But that is, okay. Uh, mountains or beaches? Um, mountains. Okay, interesting. Um, what's your favorite comfort food? Uh, French fries and pizza. Katul knows this from my time in L'Oreal. <laughs> <laughs> All the unhealthy foods. That's that's what Tarab likes. All the unhealthy foods. There you go. <laughs> Amazing. I love it. I, I Yeah, I, I, I'm a huge fr- French fries fan as well. What's your favorite virtue in others? Patience and kindness. Okay, interesting. Uh, what's your biggest pet peeve? Um, I would say dishonesty. Okay. Hmm, sounds good. What's your secret superpower? Um, that I can, uh, I, I can listen to very long speeches. I, I, I was in another life, I was a debater when I was in Pakistan, so I had to sit through like five hours of speeches. Which my family member, like at times, I, I like listening to historical speeches, uh, to see the impacts that they had on history. And I have literally nobody in my, in my social circle and family or friends who even likes listening to a speech past five minutes. So <laughs> that's definitely a superpower I, I have to say yeah okay um what's a secret uh, what's a superpower you wish you had uh being able to read quicker uh, i'm not as fast of like i i like reading i just uh get bored of it very quickly so i, I can't read more than like two hours continuously so i, I feel like if, if i had the super power of reading a lot more quicker i can get through more stuff that's a very very good one you know i wish i had the same same uh, superpower as well because i i can't get through like i have so many books lying around i'm trying to kind of read and it just takes too long you know because you can't read fast enough but i'm with you totally 
All right. So next one. Uh, what's been your uh, biggest accomplishment in the last one or two years? The last how many years? Uh, how many ever years you want to go? Like what's your what's been your biggest uh, accomplishment lately? I would say uh, I would say buying my first house for sure. Oh, um, nice. It's something that I, I again not to go into detail, but I it's just something that I, it's ever since I moved to the U.S. I, I've been wanting to have like a place for myself and my family and and to me i being able to buy my first house at the age of uh, 25 it, it was a pretty big accomplishment for me so between the stuff that i've done whether it be my business or whether it be my uh, there's a personal meaning for for me behind it so I, there's nothing that comes close to that wow that's actually really really huge so many many congratulations for you or thank you so you much for being able to achieve that feat Okay. Um, actually, that brings us to the end of our uh, rapid fire segment. Uh, I guess the next question we have is, um, what's next for you? Um, it, it's, a, it's a good question. Um, I, I, to be very transparent, I'm not the kind of person who looks 10 years ahead, 20 years ahead. I, I think there's a, there's a quote from the book, um, that there's a book out there I think it's called the boy, the the horse, the mule, and something. I, I I just remember this quote from that book, which is, you have a, a boy and a and a horse in, in a woods, and uh, the boy says, I I don't I don't I can't see past the woods, and the horse says, Can you see your next step? He says, Yes. The horse says, Just take that. And for me, I, I'm I'm for me my, I would say what well, I can tell you what my next step is, which is basically trying to grow my understanding and learning of supply chain within the current role that I have. Mm -hmm. uh, being able to develop uh, a little bit further the, the passion project of full on fi with more product listing. And then the, the third aspect is I'm actually planning a trip uh, uh, back to Pakistan next year. I, I actually went back in uh, uh, 2021, but I'm looking to go back uh, next year uh, to Pakistan to, uh, uh, to actually try to see, uh, try to, uh, uh, build a home there for, for myself and my family as well. So for me, the, between my professional life, my, you can say my hobbies or personal life, um, th those are the three major things I'm looking forward to in the next two to three years, I would say. That's awesome. That's okay. awesome. Great. All right. So, uh, so Tura, we're actually getting close to our, uh, and to close to the end of our discussion here. So, but before we wrap, uh, do you have any recommendations for our listener? And just for your reference, a recommendation could be like a book or a movie, podcast, anything you either uh, went through recently or just something that really inspired you? I, th I think the the one thing that I would recommend, uh, and this is something that I would um, that I would re recommend any young adults out there is, um, for me, I, I, I wasn't as educated my, in my personal finances which Katul knows about uh, early on in my in my career um, I think a lot of people that I know in my friend circle even in my family that I think when they were 21 22 weren't as savvy when it comes to personal finances how, how do you save how do you invest what is how do you make a passive income or not even passing in income having multiple sources of income etc I think the one recommendation that I would have for any young adults out there, young professionals out there is just pick up a book on any type of personal finances. I personally have uh, read a couple of books from Tony Robbins. Uh, Master of the Game is one of the books I would recommend if you're a young adult. Again, not to learn how to invest, but to learn what vehicles are out there for you to invest in. And then you can decide based on your personal circumstance, how you want to save, how do you want to grow your, your wealth. But that's in the United States especially, we're not as good at in teaching kids out of high school even how do you do your taxes, how do you save. And I think that's something that's incredibly important in today's day, day and age. Our economy is, is transforming, our businesses are transforming, our professional life is going to be much different than what, what it was 20 years ago or 30 years ago. And if you're, if you're not if you don't have a good understanding of how, how to manage your finances during this time, I, I think it's something that you're going to be learning the hard way over the next five years. So just my recommendation to young adults, if I were to give my, my younger self a recommendation, that's the recommendation I would have given. Great. All right. Thank you for that. Um, Thank you. With that, we are concluding the podcast, but Tarab, I want to give you an opportunity to plug any of your social platforms if you'd like. 
Um, is there anything you would like to plug, whether it's related to Flow and Five, your your personal handles, etc.? I'm a, I'm not a social influencer like uh, the people on this call today, but I would say I'm, <laughs> you can you can find me on LinkedIn, you can find me on Facebook. Uh, if you go to Flow and Five, Flow and View dot com, uh, you can find the product uh, on Amazon that I have. It redirects you, but if there's anyone that I can help professionally, I'm more than happy to help through LinkedIn. So feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. Great. How do you spell the website just for uh, context? Absolutely. It's F-I-L-O-A-N-V.com. Got it. Okay, perfect. Thanks so much. All right. Fantastic. Well, Tarab, you know, thanks so much for coming on and joining this discussion. It was great to hear more about your story and hear about where Falone 5 is headed. Um, if you guys are not already connected to this podcast on Instagram, please be sure to drop us a follow. That would be at Your Life Unfiltered on Instagram. And we would also appreciate our listeners if you guys could leave a review following listening to this episode. Um, as a relatively new podcast, just being out for about 12 weeks now, it absolutely helps from an algorithmic perspective to get more reviews. So if you guys can leave us a review, that would be fantastic. Thank you all for joining and have a great rest of your day.